Hey, good morning, Seasons Church. Welcome to Sunday with Seasons. My name's Aaron, this is Yaz. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning for church. But Happy New Year. Happy it is, New it is Year. 2021. 2021. We made it. We're so excited. It's crazy, like what that one number, it, just a big difference, 2020 to 2021. 2021. We're so expectant what God is going to do yeah. in this new year, in the life of Seasons Church, but also just in your own life. And so we're excited for it. Happy New Year. But we got some exciting things coming up in the life of our church as we kick off this yeah. new year. Yes, yeah, go ahead and tell them what That's we have coming right. up. That's right. Starting January 11th, we have 21 days of Can't prayer. Wait. It's and gonna be fasting. So great. Yeah. We're gonna start off the year right and we're gonna conclude this on January 31st. You wanna keep up with us on social media. We have some info and things that we're just gonna help inform you yeah. how to fast, right? Yeah. And we're excited for that. Yeah, it's gonna be really special. It's gonna be a lot of different opportunities. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna be praying together, um, have this opportunity to fast. That might sound something that's maybe a little scary. Maybe you've never done it before. We're gonna help make it easy for you. We're gonna have a lot of opportunities and resources to help you on this journey. So we're really excited about that. And then really another element to this is we're gonna be having um, an opportunity to help you read through scripture yeah. in the year. Um, there's an app called Read Scripture um, yeah. that we're gonna kind of provide some details on how you can engage with this throughout the year that just helps you read through the Bible. Maybe this is right. something you've always wanted to do. Yeah. Maybe you've tried it before and you've struggled to kind of complete it. This is such a great app to help make that happen for you this year in 2021. So we're, we're going to provide you with that resources. Um, so yeah, just stay tuned on social media, yeah. on our website um, for all those details coming up. But hey, that's all that the announcements we have for this morning. We're so excited so about excited. all that is to come. But we're going to go into Minute to Mingle and then we're going to continue with the rest of our service this morning. Be 
home now in power Cover this land like you've done it before Won't you do it again? Lord, say revival Lord, say did now The move of your spirit Heaven break out Come now in power Cover this land like you've done it before Seasons Church, so excited to be here with you this morning. We're going to take some time this morning to give with our tithes and our offerings. We're going to have two ways that we can do that this morning. Uh, one way is going to be through our website feature. It's going to be seasons.church slash give. And another way is going to be through our texting feature. And that's going to be Seasons Church, one word, and the amount to the number 77977. And you heard us say this once, you're going to hear us say it again, that we believe at Seasons Church, generosity is our privilege. And what we mean when we say that is we believe that generosity is our opportunity to partner with God and what He's doing through Seasons Church here in the city of Denver, Colorado. This morning, I'm just going to encourage us with a scripture here uh, in Mark. And this is in Mark 12. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came in and dropped in only two small coins. Jesus called His disciples to Him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow is given more than all the others who are making contributions, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. And I love this passage because it's so encouraging for us. You know, as we give, we need to pray, we need to seek God, we need to think about the amount that we're gonna give, and we can see the encouragement and the faith this widow has. She took the time to pray, she took the time to think, and she had so much faith in Jesus and what he was gonna do through his provision that she gave everything that she had. Now this morning, God isn't asking you to give everything you had. Matter, he's asking you to pray about it, to think about it. As we go into the new year, to seek his face and really think in your heart and settle on what you have to give so that you can partner with him and what he's doing through Seasons Church and in Denver, Colorado. I'm gonna pray for us this morning before we go back into the service. Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are. God, we thank you so much for just how faithful you've been to us throughout this past year. And God, we're so expectant for 2021 and what you have for us as a church and what you have for us as individuals as well. And God, we're just so excited and honored that we get to partner with you in what you're doing through the church here in Denver, Colorado. And we're expectant for what you have and what you're gonna do. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, good morning, Seasons Church. We're so thrilled to have you with us this morning. I just want to say Happy New Year to you. Hope it's been an amazing and special couple of weeks for you and your family as we celebrated a couple of holidays uh, since we've last been together. 
and um, I'm so excited for the new year. I'm excited for 2021, and I hope you are as well. I hope you've got your faith up, your expectation, your anticipation for what God is gonna do in your life, and I believe in our church this year. I'm so excited for what's ahead, and I know we were talking a moment ago about 21 days of prayer. I just want you to hear from me. Don't miss this opportunity. You know, we really take January as a way to set the course for the whole rest of our year. We define and decide what the year is gonna be like right now in January by how we respond and how we create space for God to speak to us, for God to lead us. We want God's ideas, we want His plans, we want His purposes for our lives. And so as a church, what we've decided to do is to set aside January to really prepare ourselves and position ourselves for what God wants to do in this upcoming year. I just wanna say, don't wait until we hit Monday the 11th to decide to be a part of this thing. Start preparing right now. Start planning right now. Get yourself ready. Decide what type of fast you're gonna do. Start jotting down some things this week that you're gonna be praying for and believing for because we know that God is going to speak to us. He's gonna show up and he's gonna do something special in our church community, but most importantly, in our individual lives. As we start this new year, you know, from time to time, we we love to bring in what we call friends of the house, guest preachers that speak that we believe that have a message for our church. And as we start this new year, there's nobody better that I could think of to have kick off the first Sunday of the year than my great friend, Ethan Vance. He's a pastor at Church on the Move. He's been a longtime friend. We're going on 20 years of friendship. And we worked together for a number of years, over a decade, building church, serving people in ministry. And we've just got some of the best memories and best experiences that we've had. And Ethan is an unbelievable pastor. He cares so much for people. I think you're gonna see that today as he communicates, but he's an unbelievable leader. He's a church builder. And most importantly, he's a phenomenal friend. I love Ethan and his wife, Sarah, so much. And it's one of the reasons why Ethan is one of the overseers for our church. And uh, he, along with a couple of other pastors, provide great spiritual oversight covering for our church and for Becca and I. So today, you're not, you're not hearing from a stranger. This is not somebody that we're just kind of bringing in, but this is a friend of the house. This is a personal friend of mine. And I know that you're gonna walk away better than you were as we start today. And so I hope you got a Bible. Grab your notebook. Be ready for Pastor Ethan's message. Come on, let's go. Hey, what's up, Seasons Church? Ethan here, and I'm so thrilled that we get to spend a few minutes together today. And I've been friends with Pastor Josh and Becca for a long time, and I just want you to know, I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of Seasons Church. And if you're watching this, you probably fall into one of two categories. Either you're part of Seasons Church, or someone that's part of the Seasons Church family shared this with you because they really like you. Either way, for the next few minutes, we're family. And I am so thrilled uh, that we get to look forward to a new year And before I say anything else, I just want to say, how great is it to be moving into 2021? 2020, as much of a joke as it is, it really has been maybe the hardest year ever. So many strange things and so much to navigate. And I don't know of a time when one number on the calendar has meant so much to us. Just flipping that over from a zero to a one brings with it so much optimism and so much hope that this year is gonna be a great year. So as we look forward, I just have a simple question that I wanna ask you today. What is your vision for this year based on? And when I say vision, I mean your hopes and your dreams and your ambitions for this year. What is it based on? Because if it's based on the wrong thing, it's likely you're gonna get the wrong results. In fact, I just wanna take a few minutes today and what I feel like God has put on my heart for Seasons Church is just to challenge our focus as we move into this year. Because your focus will determine your vision and it's gonna determine your direction. Here's what you already know. What you focus on does two really important things. It creates a reaction inside of you and it ultimately sets the direction that you move. Let me illustrate it this way. When I got married, my wife and I, uh, my wife is part of a scuba diving family, and it's because her dad is a marine biologist. So he teaches scuba diving, and he takes his classes scuba diving. So Sarah grew up scuba diving, and to marry into her family, I had to get certified to be a scuba diver. Now, 
Uh, somewhat ironically, I did all of my uh, diving instruction and certification in a swimming pool in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which as we all know, is the scuba diving capital of the world. Not at all. It's a very strange way to get certified to scuba dive. So you learn all of the techniques and all the tricks, but it doesn't really mean anything to you until you're in the ocean. So when we went on our honeymoon, I went scuba diving with Sarah for the first time in the ocean, and it was beautiful, breathtaking. The, our, we had a guide that was you know, taking us down coral reefs and we saw absolutely beautiful fish, yellow and orange and bright colors, and it's just so peaceful and quiet under the water, and it was absolutely wonderful until our guide took us to this one particular spot, and there was a big table rock leaning against the reef. And our guide was ahead of us and he looked under this rock and he called us over, he motioned us over and he said, look under the rock, look under the rock. And so I went down to the bottom of the ocean right by the sand and I'm looking under this big table rock and it's, it's dark, there's a shadow under there you can't quite see. So it took my eyes a second to adjust. And as my eyes are adjusting, I realized that resting under this rock is a shark. And it's about from me to where this camera is sitting in front of me. Now, it's just like a medium-sized shark. But when there's nothing between you and a shark under the ocean water, and you're like 60 feet below the surface, it, it might as well have been a 50-foot shark. And everything in me panicked. And I am not ashamed to tell you I wanted to run for the hills. So I did what any rational human being would do. I backpedaled away from the shark and I started to head to the surface. Everything inside of me was just saying, get out of here. Partly because I had just been watching Shark Week on TV and it did not feel safe at all. And so I'm headed for the surface. Well, my guide knows something that I've forgotten. In that moment, everything in me has forgotten that when you're scuba diving, the worst possible thing for you to do is surface really quickly because there's all this oxygen and gas in your bloodstream. And if you surface too quickly, the oxygen expands because it's been under pressure in the water and it can cause serious health problems. It can even cause death. And so I'm headed for, you know, damage 101 to Ethan's body and I'm headed for the surface and my guide reaches up and he grabs my leg and he, he asks me to do the exact opposite thing that I want to do. Instead of heading for the surface and running for the hills, he pulls me to the, 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 the bottom of the ocean and right there in the sand, he asks me to kneel down and he puts his hand on my chest and he just goes, breathe, just, just breathe like this. And when you're, when you're scuba diving, you have an oxygen indicator that you wear kind of on your wrist and it's like a, like a gas gauge and my little needle is just plummeting because I'm, I'm sucking down my oxygen. He's trying to get me to relax so I have enough oxygen that I can surface slowly. And here's the picture. Because I was focused on the wrong thing, I had the wrong reaction. And it was natural. I mean, I, I saw a shark and I wanted to run, but here's what was really happening. I wasn't really in any danger. The guide was there with me and he wasn't going to let me get hurt. And that shark, I didn't know it when I first saw the shark. That shark was harmless. That shark didn't want anything to do with me. But yet, because I was just focused on the danger of a shark, I had the wrong reaction. Your focus this year will determine your reaction to everything happening around you and ultimately it will determine your direction. And I believe that it's possible, and I'm not wishing this on anybody, but I believe it's possible that 2021 might not be heaven on earth. It might have some difficulty. There might be some challenges for us in 2021. And if our hope and our faith is just that because the calendar changed, the year changes, maybe we'll be let down. And so I just want to challenge you. What are you focused on as you head into this year? Because a year cannot be our savior. A year cannot be the source of our hope. A new year cannot be the thing that makes us feel certain that everything's going to work out. Our faith has to be in something else. So here's my surprisingly bad pep talk for you as we move into this year. Lower your expectations for 2021 because 2021 is not your savior. And if your faith is in your circumstances changing so that you'll be okay, it's possible that you'll be let down. There's an amazing picture of this in the Bible. In John chapter 18, Jesus is about to be arrested. And during the week before he gets arrested, we call it Holy Week as we move toward Easter, there's some amazing things that happens. Jesus has been spending three years with his disciples, these 12 guys that he's called together to follow him, and, and they love Jesus. And they're believing that Jesus is going to change everything. In fact, Jesus has been teaching all these years that, 
The kingdom of heaven is gonna come. In fact, he taught his disciples to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. And they're believing that Jesus is gonna change everything. In fact, they had a little bit of a misunderstanding that maybe he was gonna even overthrow the Roman Empire and he was gonna start a new rule as the king of the Jews. And as they journey to Jerusalem, everything starts to change. Everything starts to get kind of tense and a little bit of upheaval starts to arise around Jesus. When they first get to the city, there's something happening in Jerusalem. It's the Feast of Passover, which means that hundreds of thousands of people have, have made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and the city is packed. So when they first get there, they don't, they don't arrive to a peaceful city. They arrive to a lot of noise and a lot of commotion. And as they move through the week, that commotion starts to get louder and everything around Jesus starts to be more tense. This is the week of Holy Week when Jesus walks into the temple and he throws over the tables and he rebukes the, the, the vendors there in the temple for making money off of the people that had made the pilgrimage to worship. And he, and he has these moments of anger and these moments of prayer and these, these deep moments where he's sweating drops of blood as he's moving toward the crucifixion and the disciples are around him during this. And they see all this tension and all of this, this these emotions start to get, get bigger and bigger and and tighter and tighter around Jesus. And I wonder how many of us have felt that way this year, just where everything seems like it's just a little more tense. Everything's on edge. Maybe your relationships, maybe your family. Maybe it's because you've been cooped up in the same house and so many things have been shut down. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe there's been tension around your physical health or your finances, and it just feels like things are getting tense. And in the middle of that tension, Peter has his hope in the wrong thing. And he has his focus on the wrong thing. He has his focus on the circumstances around Jesus. And here's the scene. They're in the garden and Jesus is about to be arrested. Judas leads the soldiers into the garden. It's in the middle of the night. So they would have been walking in with torches. And I can imagine as the disciples were there with Jesus and they're praying, that you hear off in the distance the soldiers start to get closer and closer and you hear this is, this is not one or two people walking up. This is a big group of people and they have, they have torches and swords and these are armed soldiers and they're not showing up to say hi to us. They're showing up for a different reason and everything starts to get a little tense. And in that moment, one of the disciples, Peter, reaches down and he grabs a sword and he pulls it out. And in, in, a, in an attempt to defend Jesus from these soldiers, he reaches out and he cuts off the ear of one of the guys that's there. In fact, this is what John chapter 18 and verse 10 says. It says, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. And in this moment, Peter unintentionally has the wrong reaction based on what he's focused on. See, he's lost focus on Jesus and he's only focused on the circumstances and the things around him. And so he does what he thinks is right. Much like me in the bottom of the ocean, just running from the shark and trying to go to the surface, Peter tries to do the right thing, but because his focus is wrong, his reaction is wrong. And in this moment of cutting off this guy's ear, he actually cuts off two people's future. First, he cuts off his own future. See, Jesus knows something. When Peter cuts off this guy's ear, it's likely that Peter is about to get arrested and maybe even crucified right along with Jesus. But that's not Peter's future. Peter's called to be one of the church leaders and write some of the books of the Bible that we have. Peter has a bright future with God, but Peter doesn't realize that in cutting off this man's ear, he's actually severing his hope of a great future. And so Jesus does something remarkable. Now think about this. There's soldiers all around, it's dark, there's torches. Peter's just in a flash, drawn a sword and cut this guy's ear off and now this guy's ear. Think about it, we can read through this so fast. There's an ear, a dude's ear just sitting on the ground, bloody and the guy's just, I mean, you know, when you cut off an ear, it doesn't, things happen, things are coming out and just, he reaches down and he puts it back on. And everybody is just sitting there staring at Jesus in this moment of a miracle. And when Jesus does this, he's not just saving Peter's future. 
He's saving Malchus' future as well. You see, Malchus, it says, is a servant in the temple, which means this. It means that in order for him to serve in the temple as one of the Jewish servants, he cannot have any blemish or, or deformation on his body. He can't be missing a finger or an ear or a nose. So when Peter cuts off his ear, he makes it impossible for this man to continue to serve in the temple. So when Jesus puts this man's ear back on, he's restoring this man's future and he's saving Malchus and Peter. But Peter doesn't realize what Jesus has just done. He's so focused on the negativity of Jesus being arrested and the circumstances going the wrong way that he continues to have the wrong response. In fact, as we go through the rest of John 18, we see that Jesus denies even knowing, or Peter denies even knowing Jesus three times. In verse 17, it says that one of the, uh, the girls that's there after Jesus is arrested asks Peter, he says, she says, hey, wait a minute, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? And Peter says, I am not. Then we find Peter in verse 18 warming himself at the fire and he, he again denies Jesus three times. Starting in verse 26, it says this, one of the high priest's servants, this is the third denial of Jesus, he says, a relative, and think about this, this is a relative of one of the guys, uh, of one of the, the guy that Peter cut his ear off, it's one of his relatives. And this guy is definitely gonna know who Peter is because you just cut off my relative's ear. And he says, wait a minute, weren't you with Jesus? Didn't I see you in the garden? And again, Peter denies it. And in that moment, it says in John 18, 27, the rooster began to crow. Now, why is that significant? Because Jesus had looked at Peter earlier and he said, you're gonna deny me tonight, three times before the rooster crows. It's very poetic, but it's actually Jesus in that moment giving Peter a little glimmer of hope saying, I knew this was gonna happen and I haven't given up on you just because you've denied me. So over and over again, we see the circumstances getting negative and Peter having the wrong reaction. And this is remarkable because when Jesus is crucified, Peter is cut off. Peter doesn't have a moment of restoration between him and Jesus when Jesus is crucified. All he knows is Jesus is dead and I denied him. Can you imagine the dejection that Peter would have felt? Can you imagine the shame that he would have felt over how he had reacted and how he had treated Jesus? So what does Peter do? Well, the, the book of John goes on to tell us that Peter just kind of leaves everything. Everything that Jesus had called him to do, his call to ministry, his call to reach people, his call to preach the gospel, he leaves it all when Jesus is crucified and he goes back to what he knew to do. He goes back to fishing. Now, here's what's remarkable. Jesus had called him to leave his nets and to follow him. But very often when we have a wrong reaction, we go back to what we know. We go back to the things that are comfortable. We go back to the things that are familiar. And I think the danger for many of us during this season is that if things are negative, instead of moving forward with God, we shrink back to the things that we can control. Our efforts, our endeavors, the things that we can do, and we put our reliance on those things. And can I tell you, those things are not your savior. Your ability to control things this year is not your savior. Your ability to, 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 to save money and hold on to the things that you have, that's not your salvation. This year and the circumstances of this year are not your salvation. And in a beautiful moment in John chapter 21, Jesus redefines Peter's focus and in redefining his focus, he redefines his future. And so here's the, the lesson I think for us going into 2021, is it can be very easy to have a wrong reaction based on our circumstances. That's how Peter reacted. And it can be very easy to rely on ourselves. This is exactly what we find Peter doing. But in John chapter 21, Jesus shows up on the beach where, G where, where Peter is fishing. And Peter is in a boat with some of the other disciples and they're, they're fishing and they see off in the distance, they see a guy on the beach making lunch for him. And I can imagine that there was probably a moment where Peter is kind of far away from Jesus and he, he kind of recognizes his form, if, you, if you've seen a friend from a, from a long way away, you kind of go, that, that looks like my friend. And I wonder how that was for Peter, thinking, that guy on the beach looks an awful lot like Jesus, but there's no, there's no way that could be Jesus. And then Jesus yells to them in the boat. He says, hey guys, have you caught anything? 
This wasn't the first time that Jesus asked Peter that question. And I imagine in that moment, Peter hears the voice of Jesus asking a familiar question. And in his heart, everything changes because he realizes that the one who promised him a different future and a different hope and a different salvation and a different anchor for his soul had risen from the dead. Now, as if you follow Jesus for a while, Jesus being alive after being dead is kind of old news. But for Peter, this was shocking. Jesus was alive. Now, here's the really remarkable thing to me. If the guy that you just denied and he died, if he came back to life, would you want to face this guy? Would you want to talk to this guy or would you be really ashamed of what you had done? And I love Peter's response in John 21. When he hears Jesus call out to him, he jumps out of the boat. He can't even wait for the boat to get back to shore. They're not rowing fast enough for him to get to Jesus. So he jumps out of the boat into the water and he runs through the water onto the beach and he falls down and he worships Jesus. And in that moment, I don't know what you would be expecting of Jesus. I don't know what Peter was expecting of Jesus, but I know what my response would be. My response to Peter would, if I was Jesus, I would want to set all of this straight. I'd be like, hey, let's talk about what happened before I died. Let's go back there and let's get this right. But Jesus never once brings up Peter's past. He never talks in the past tense to Peter. He simply asks Peter three present tense questions and he gives him three future tense assignments. He says, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. He says, then feed my sheep. He asks him again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, of course I love you. Then feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, I love you. Then feed my sheep. What was was Jesus doing asking Peter that question three times? He was redeeming every one of Peter's denials of Jesus. And something remarkable happened on that beach with Peter. His focus changed from the circumstances that were negative. His salvation moved from his efforts to provide for him and his family by fishing and doing what he knew to do. And all of his focus shifted to Jesus. And in that moment, because he saw Jesus risen from the dead, the Savior, the Lord of his life, in person, and he knew that this changes everything, he had faith now to go do whatever Jesus asked him to do. He had faith to move into an uncertain future, not knowing how it would all work out because he knew that the one who overcame sin, death, and the grave was going with him. And he knew this, if that Jesus is going with me, I have everything I need. I don't need any other question answered. I don't need any other form of provision. I can trust Jesus. So here's the lesson from the life of Peter. And I think a lesson that applies very vividly to us in 2021 is that if our focus is this year being better, we'll probably be let down. If this year is focused on our efforts and we're just gonna try it, we're we're gonna set some things right this year, we're gonna do better than we did last year, we'll probably be let down. But if you shift your focus from your circumstances, if you shift your focus from your efforts to Jesus, you're gonna find that you can have the best year of your life if you're following Jesus closely. So I'll ask you one more time. What's your focus as you go into this year? What's your vision built on? What's it anchored in? Move your focus from this year being better and your hope of this year being, uh, you know, just not 2020, right? Move your focus from that to trusting Jesus. You could say it this way. Lower your expectations for 2021, but raise your expectations of Jesus. Believe that Jesus has every answer for everything that you need. Believe that he has wisdom for every question that you have. Believe that he has comfort for every place where you're you're, you're nervous or you're worried or you're anxious or you're scared or you're afraid. Believe that he has hope for every place that you're hurting. Believe that he has healing for every place where you've been scarred and you've been cut and you've been hurt. Believe that he has everything that you need for this year because if your focus is on Jesus, then what happens to your reaction? Well, you're gonna have the right reaction. What happens to your direction? Well, you're gonna head the right direction. But if your focus is on your circumstances, if your focus is on your effort, then the odds are you're gonna have the wrong reaction and head the wrong direction. 
So I believe what Jesus is calling us to this year is just a moment on the beach with him. And I can't think of a better way to kind of end our time together today than just to turn our attention toward Jesus. And I'd love for you, wherever you're at, just to maybe take a deep breath and exhale and just say, okay, if my focus this year needs to be Jesus in order for me to move forward into what God has for me, then how do I see Jesus? Is he the center of my life? Is he the most important thing to me? Are my plans and my efforts this year based on him and his direction, or am I trying to do this alone? And I would bet for some of us, 2021 gives us an opportunity to invite Jesus into our life in a whole new way. For others of us, we've been following Jesus maybe for a while. Maybe you've been to church and you'd say, Ethan, I know all the stories, I know all the songs, but Jesus just isn't the center of my life. This year gives us an opportunity to put him back at the center like never before. And I believe this, if you'll do that, you will find a peace and a rest and a confidence that even a bad year can't shake because we're trusting in an unshakable God. So would you do this? Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes right wherever you're at? I'd love the chance to pray for you. And if you're watching and you say, Ethan, I, I need to put Jesus back at the center of my life, or maybe you say, I've never done that, and I'd love to do that for the first time. If you'll pray this prayer with me, Jesus will meet you right where you're at, and he'll do what only he can do. He will forgive sins and give you a brand new start. You don't have to get these words exactly right, but if you repeat this prayer after me with your words from your heart, Jesus will meet you right where you're at. Just say this, dear Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is alive and that his presence in my life changes everything. I give my hope to you, my trust to you, and I'm looking to you for everything I need this year. Would you meet me where I'm at? Would you forgive my sins and give me a brand new start? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so proud of you if you prayed that prayer. This can be your best year ever. And here's my challenge to you. Don't try to do this alone. Get connected to your church. Get connected to Seasons Church. Jump into all that they're doing because if you'll give God this next year, he will blow your mind at how he shows up in your life. Thanks for spending a few minutes with me. We love you guys. Come on, that was outstanding. I hope you're walking away encouraged from Pastor Ethan's message today. Come on, make some noise in the chat. Post what you like. Say thank you to Pastor Ethan. I think that was an unbelievable first message of 2021. Hey, like he said just a moment ago, if you want to make that decision, if you made the decision today to follow Jesus, we want you to know, we want you to hear from us. We're so excited for you. And we think this is the greatest decision that you could ever possibly make. We want to help you take your next steps. And so there's going to be a link on the screen, a link in the chats. If you'll just go there and let us know that you made that decision, we want to send you just one email to help you with your next steps, to help you know, where do I go from here in my new relationship, in my new walk with God? But just know, we're all celebrating with you today. Hey, we've got an unbelievable month coming up. We're starting a brand new series next week that I think is going to prepare our church for really what God's got for us in this year. It's gonna help us position ourselves for what He would say to us, for how He would lead us, and I hope that you'll be a part of it. Just don't forget, 21 days of prayer and fasting is coming, so get ready, make plans now. Don't miss this exciting opportunity. Maybe it's your first time, it's a perfect time to get involved and to be a part of something so special and so significant. Hey, we love you, we're praying for you, and we'll see you soon.